Hello again. I have a pink bear this time. I got him for Valentine's Day one year. He's going to listen to the story. This story is a chapter book. So I'm going to read a few chapters and then I am going to put it away and read it again. So you'll have to look for another video to hear the rest of the story. The book is called Beanie Not Beanhead by Susan Wojcikowski. It's really funny. So listen away. I will show you pictures when there are pictures. Otherwise, you can just listen. Chapter 1. The Test. My teacher, Mrs. Babbitt, wears a different pair of earrings practically every day of the year. She has heart earrings for Valentine's Day, pumpkins for Halloween, turkeys for Thanksgiving, candy canes for Christmas. She has snowmen, flowers, leaves, and American flags. She has big dangly smiley faces for days when something fun is going to happen and question marks for days when she's going to give a test. One day, she walked into the classroom after lunch wearing the question marks. All of us, except for Catherine Pruitt, the class brain, groaned. Miss Babbitt went to the blackboard and wrote, Science quiz, healthy bodies. Name two things that are harmful to your health and tell their bad effect on the body. Name one food at the bottom of the food chain and one at the bottom of the food pyramid and one food food at the top. Name four ways to keep your bodies healthy. I took a sheet of paper out and wrote Bernice Sherwin Hendricks. That's my name. I'm named Bernice after my great grandma and I'm Sherwin Hendricks on account of my mother sticking her last name onto my dad's when they got married, which I hate because it takes so long to write. I would like to write just write plain beanie on my papers, but my teacher does not allow nicknames. So on paper, I am Bernice Sherwin Hendricks. But in talking, I am Beanie, except if you're, ma if you're mad at me. Then you could call me Bernice Lorraine Sherwin Hendricks, which is what my mother called me when she's mad. Do not call me Beanhead, though, ever. My big brother Philip calls me that, and I hate it. After my name, I put science. Then I put my teacher's name, Miss Babbitt. I like her. She smells nice. After that, I put the date. All that stuff together is called the heading, which is what we have to put on every single paper, even if it's just a spelling pretest. After the heading, I skipped a line and put, number one, smoking can give you lung cancer. Taking bad drugs can fry your brain. Number two, spaghetti is at the bottom of the food pyramid and candy and junk food are at the top. I was just writing a number three on my paper when out of the corner of my eye, I saw something moving. It was an ant carrying a big crumb of food along the top of the bookcase next to my desk. I watched the ant go around a box of rulers and over a stack of workbooks. I watched it climb up a plant and walk all over the leaves before it figured out which way was down. By the time the ant got to the end of the bookcase, I had named it Hulk. I watched Hulk climb up the pencil sharpener and go marching right into one of the pencil holes. Come on, Hulk, get out of there, I whispered nervously when the ant didn't come out for a few seconds. Just then, Kevin Gates got up and walked over to the sharpener. I jumped out of my chair so fast that it fell over. I jumped right in front of Kevin. Most of the time, I'm scared of him. Kevin knocks my lucky eraser off my desk when he walks by and blows milk at people through his straw and cuts in line in front of people. He even cut ahead of me once when I was the line leader but I was too scared of him. Oh, here's a picture. There's Kevin Gates and Beanie, afraid for the ant in the pencil sharpener. But I was too scared to tell, of him to tell. This time though, I didn't even think about it. I just told Kevin, you can't use the sharpener. Kevin pushed me. You and what army's gonna stop me, Beanie Weenie? He asked and he lifted his pencil toward, toward the hole. Just in time, Hulk came out of the hole and went on his way, lugging the crumb down the side of the bookcase and out of sight, like he didn't have a care in the world, like he hadn't just taken his life in his hands by going into that sharpener, like he hadn't just put me in danger of getting punched on the arm by Kevin after school in the bus line. I went back to my desk. I picked up my chair. I picked up my pencil, and I wrote, Four ways to keep your bodies healthy are... Before I could write any more, Miss Babbitt said, Time's up. Please pass your papers forward. My face got all hot. 
It was the first time in my whole life I hadn't finished a test. I knew I would flunk healthy bodies. Just to keep from crying, I made myself think of something happy. I thought about a time when I went to a horse farm with the Brownie Scouts and rode on a horse named Mr. Bumble and fed him a carrot and he didn't even eat my hand off. The next Monday, Miss Babbitt walked up and down the aisles giving back the tests. When she handed me mine, I saw a big fat red F at the top. The first thing I did was crumble up the paper and stick it inside my desk. The second thing I did was blame Hulk for making me flunk. The third thing I did was think about Mr. Bumble the horse. I would like you children to take these quizzes home, have them signed by a parent, and return them tomorrow, Miss Babbitt said. As I was closing my desk lid, I pulled the wrinkled test from under my math book. All afternoon, I kept worrying about how I would tell my parents I flunked. It's not that my parents are mean. It's just that I worry about things. Once I had a rash on my thumb, and I worried that my thumb would fall off. When I go on Ferris wheels at the amusement park, I worry that my car will come unhooked <coughs> and fall down. This book makes me laugh. I never leave my seat to go buy popcorn at the movies because I worry that I won't be able to find a seat when I come back. My mother calls me a worry wart. On the bus ride home, Carol Ann, who lives two houses from me and is in my class, asked what I got on the test. You know Miss Babbitt doesn't like us to tell other people our grades, I answered. You flunked, huh? Yeah, I showed Carol Ann the test. It's pretty wrinkled, she said. She smoothed out the paper and read what Miss Babbitt had put at the top next to the F. This is not your wet best work, Bernice. You could be in big trouble, Carol Ann told me. Your parents might not sign it, or they might punish you by not letting you watch TV for a year, not even Saturday morning cartoons. They might even ask for a meeting with Miss Babbitt. What am I going to do? Here is Beanie talking with Carol Ann on the bus. What am I going to do? Well, said Carol Ann, you could try what my big sister Margot did once when she flunked a math test and had to get it signed. She put the paper in with the whole stack of other papers and told my dad he had to sign all of them. She figured he would get so tired that pretty soon he'd stop looking at the papers and just sign. Did it work? No way. He yelled so loud I thought I'd bust my eardrum. But maybe your dad isn't as smart as my dad. We got off the bus on our street. Just as I was stuffing the paper into my backpack, a gust of cold March wind came marching along and snatched it away. For a second, I thought all my problems were solved. It would blow away into the clouds. But then I realized the paper might not blow into the clouds. It might blow over to the laundromat, around the corner, and someone might pick it up and put it on the bulletin board inside the door. Then the whole neighborhood would think that Bernice Sherwin Hendricks doesn't even know four ways to keep her body healthy. Or it might blow two streets down and stop right on Boomer Fenton's front steps. It's not that I like Boomer or anything like that, even though he gave me a valentine this year that had a picture of an ice cube tray on it with one ice cube saying to another, you're cool. And I gave him a valentine of two monkeys in a tree that said, I'm ape over you. Really, I don't like Boomer. I just sit with him on the bus sometimes so I can see the birthmark on his arm that looks like a dog's head. I decided I wouldn't want my test to land on the, his front steps where he might see it and stop thinking I'm cool and stop letting me look at his dog birthmark. Carol Ann and I ran after the paper. Every time it came to a stop and one of us was about to grab it, the wind blo would blow it away again. Finally, Carol Ann caught up with it and jumped on it with both feet. I reached down and grabbed it. I got the paper, but the corner where Carol Ann was standing ripped off. It looked pretty sad, all wrinkled and torn and covered with dirty sneaker prints. When I got home, I showed it to my big brother, Philip, and asked him what he thought Mom and Dad would do when they saw it. You're dead, lean head, he said, and he went back to looking at himself in the mirror. Philip is 13 and looks in the mirror a lot. I tried it once. What could be so much fun about looking in the mirror for a half an hour? But all I saw were my fat cheeks, which my brother says look a lot like a chipmunk's cheeks when they're full of nuts and my 23 freckles. When I thought about Philip saying I was dead and Carol Ann saying I might not get to watch TV for a year, I decided to use Carol Ann's plan. Here is her brother, Philip, looking in the mirror. 
and she is showing him her test. I put three papers on top of my science test. One was a math paper that said, this is fine work, Bernice. One was a workbook page from last year that the teacher had put a smiley face on. One was a spelling test with 100% written at the top of the, in red. I waited for just the right time to give the papers to mom or dad, but the right time didn't come. At bedtime, I finally had to do it, right time or not. Mom was at the kitchen table paying bills and talking to her checkbook, which meant it was a bad time to give them to her. Dad was in front of the TV watching a basketball game and punching the arm of his chair every few seconds, which meant it was a bad time to give it to him too. I decided to leave them with Dad since he was in a dark room. I put the papers on the floor in front of him and told him to sign them whenever he had time. Then I ran up to my room and jumped into bed with my stuffed moose, Jingle Bell. I pulled the covers over our heads and told Jingle Bell the whole story about Hulk and the flunking of the test and Carol Ann's plan. Jingle Bell understood. He always does. For a while, I could hear Dad yelling, Come on, Celtics! Then a commercial came on. After a minute, I heard Dad coming slowly up the stairs. I pretended to be asleep. I squeezed my eyes shut tight. My heart was pounding fast. Dad sat down on the edge of the bed. Beanie, he said as he pulled the covers off my head. These are super papers. I opened my eyes wide. I sat up. It had worked. Carol Ann's dumb idea had worked. Oh, except for the bottom one, he went on. Daddy, it wasn't my fault. I said, talking as fast as I could. It was all the dumb aunt's fault. Hope was so dumb, he got lost in the pencil sharpener. And it was Kevin's fault, too. He shouldn't have been sharpening a pencil right in the middle of a test. And Miss Babbitt shouldn't have let him. It's a rule about don't leave your seat during a test. And Carol Ann, she told me to trick you. It was all her fault, and Philip scared me. He told me I was dead. Here's Dad sitting on the edge of her bed. Dad put his hand gently over my mouth. Beanie, you seem to be blaming an awful lot of people for this. The only name I haven't heard is yours. Now calm down and tell me what happened. After I told him the whole story and told him the only reason I tricked him was on account of not wanting to miss Saturday morning cartoons till I'd grown up, he said, Do you think you're the first kid on earth ever to have a problem in school? Well, I bet you never did, I said. Yes, I did. My fifth grade teacher once sent a note home to my mother when I got into a fight at school. I was so scared I hid, hid in my closet for six hours. My parents looked everywhere for me. For me. They thought I was, a, I was kidnapped. But then they found you and hugged you and everything was fine, right, Dad? Not on your life. I wasn't allowed out of the house to play for a month. I started to cry. I knew I was in trouble, even more trouble, than the time I saw a frog hopping around near the front door of my school and let it in. Don't worry, Beanie, Dad said. I signed the paper. I know you do your best in school, but from now on, promise me you'll be honest. I promise. And you won't try to trick me, even if Carol Ann thinks it's a good idea? I won't. And whose fault was the act? Well, sort of mine. Daddy kissed Pincher, first on my forehead, then on my nose. I hugged him so hard he grunted. Then he tucked me and Jingle Bell under the covers and wiped my tears with his big bandana handkerchief. The next morning at the bus stop, Carolyn asked me how it had gone. My dad signed the paper. Your problems aren't over, you know, she told me. You have to explain to Miss Babbitt why your paper looks like it went through a war. I'm dead, I said. Want to know what I did when my dog chewed my homework to shreds? No, I yelled at Carolyn. I got on the bus and sat down next to Boomer Fenton. The chapter I will read next time is called Glamour Nails. So tune in soon and it'll be on there. Bye everyone.